Thank you. If you are the leader, press star now. After the tone, state your name, followed by the pound or hash sign. Thank you. You will now be placed into conference. To mute your line, press star 6. To unmute, press pound 6. We'll be starting our webinar in about two or three minutes. Okay. I'm trying to log into the live meeting manager and uh, it's bumping me out saying that I'm not recognized. I'm actually using a different computer. Would that be the problem? Uh, it may be. Um, if you follow the original link in, though, it should um, it should ask you for your email address. Um, you should be able to get in that way. I sent this email. Are home. you using the link that was emailed to you? Right. And I sent the email home, and I'm using the link to get in now. And it's asking me if I want to download a file, and I'm doing that. Okay, you should be okay then. Once it okay. downloads it. Hello. Yes, we'll be starting our webinar in about two minutes. Okay. Uh, it keeps coming up with a join a scheduled meeting using the required information. It gives the meeting ID number and it requests an entry code. And saying uh, that I don't, the information was not recognized or I don't have permission to join the meeting. <coughs> Yes, let me give you that entry code um, right now. It probably okay. is somehow related to you um, logging in from a different machine. Sure. The, the meeting ID is capital K, mm -hmm. capital R, 689, capital S is in SAM. Okay, that's what I have. The uh, attendee entry code is 9, mm -hmm. capital N, lowercase b, capital N, double quote, seven four. Okay, let me try that. Yeah, it's gotten me to a login page, so I'll, I'll be all set, I think. Good. So let's give everybody just a couple more minutes. Sure. One other housekeeping item. Um, Apparently, uh, Terry Campbell, one of the presenters, and Richard Wakeland um, are logged in as attendees, which should be fine. What we will do is uh, we'll scroll through your slides as you go, um, Richard and Terry. So it should work just fine. You won't have access to move the slides back and forth, but you can just give us instructions to do that. Okay. Hey Dave. Yes, sir. Uh, when we're giving you instructions, I got a lot of animation in there. It might be kind of difficult to, you know, just say click. It's going to be very disruptive. Uh, is there a, another way to log in as a presenter instead of an attendee? Yes. Yeah, so if you want to, you could uh, log out and then log back in and use the presenter entry code, which is which is capital D lowercase d, capital P, as in Paul, 6, exclamation point, capital D, lowercase j. And th the meeting ID, I think you should have, but it's KR, both capitals, capital K, capital R, 6, 8, 9, capital S. Okay, that's... Uh Uppercase D, lowercase D, capital P as in Paul, six exclamation point, D as in David, uppercase, J as in John, lowercase, and then the uh, other one was KR6, and then what else? Eight, nine, capital S. F as in Frank. 
Sorry, S is in Sam. Okay. Okay, while you're doing that, why don't we go ahead and get started? And sorry, everybody, for some of the technical difficulties. Um, welcome to our webinar on industrial flow meters and accuracy in industrial flow meters. My name is Dave Showalter, and I'm Director of Marketing at Alden Lab. And on the first slide here, we have a couple of housekeeping items to go through. So first of all, um, the audio system. What we're going to do to start out with is mute all of the attendees' phones. Um, the reason for this is just to try to keep some of the noise down. Um, if people are in cubicles or um, there's just background noise, it'll, it'll mute some of that. Um, in terms of asking questions, generally in the webinars, we, um, since a lot of people can be in attendance, what we do is we ask questions online through text. But today we have a, a smaller, a little bit more intimate group, so I think it'll be fine in the end to, uh, to ask the questions verbally. But I would ask that you save your questions until the end when we unmute the phone. We will be making these slides available uh, on our website after the webinar. So if you wanted access to them or you wanted to show them to somebody else, they will be available. And we can send every, all the attendees uh, an email giving you the link for that. We're also recording this webinar. And so um, if people are interested later to listen to the webinar, they can get a, um, a recording, which would be a Windows media file. Um, so with that, I'm going to mute the attendees' phones right now. The leader has turned lecture on, and your line will remain muted until the conference leader unmutes your line. Okay. Um, we'll now move on to the next slide and provide the agenda for this meeting. So first on the agenda, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Um, ben from Richard Wakeland at Fluidic Techniques, we're going to hear about flow meter types and when to calibrate flow meters. Um, from Terry Campbell, we'll hear about how calibration and accuracy affect the power industry. And then from Zach Hennig at Air Liquide, we'll hear a process industry perspective and he'll give some case studies on steam delivery. And finally, we'll hear from Phil Stacy at Alden Lab about how calibration of flow meters really works. So first thing on the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about current economic conditions. This makes uh, calibration, of, calibration of some meters more important than ever because um, especially if you're delivering something, as we'll hear from Zach a little bit later in the program, um, to accurately measure what you're delivering is critical and any lost revenue becomes even more critical in economic conditions like these. Because uh, it costs more to calibrate a flow meter than not to calibrate, this highlights, the current economic conditions highlight the importance of deciding when not to calibrate as well. So industrial flow meters can be important for plant efficiency, for understanding um, exactly how much flow you have. If you don't know that, then you can't operate at peak efficiency, and that can result in lost revenue or increased costs over time. Also, it's important for plant safety. And in the next slide, I'll give a case in point, which had to do with feed water and nuclear power plants. So uh, this example comes to us courtesy of Dr. John Bickle from Talisman International. Basically, the secondary side uh, calorimetric power based on temperature difference is used to calibrate reactor power for nuclear power plants. And if the feed water flow instruments become inaccurate over time, then the determination of reactor power will be inaccurate. And so some plants have unknowingly operated at power levels above what the license allowed. And uh, one solution to this would be creating large allowances for 
slow in accuracies, but this would result in lost revenue for the plant, basically creating less power than you think you are. Um, so it's important both for safety and, uh, and for revenue. And the reference there is shown from uh, uh, an NRC license event report with the uh, session number available if you're interested in looking into that. So first now I want to give a brief introduction to Alden before I turn the floor, turn the floor over to Richard. Um, Alden does flow meter calibration. We do uh, all meter types from a quarter inch to 48 inch pipe size corresponding to flows up to 35,000 GPM. Alden also solves problems in, within plant hydraulics. Um, including emergency uh, core cooling systems, some strainer testing, as well as tank drawdown testing, uh, looking at air entrainment into pipes. We optimize drinking water and wastewater systems through physical and numerical modeling. We do cooling water intake evaluation, both from a hydraulic perspective the image you should see here uh, shows a, um, some air being entrained into a pump intake, a scale pump intake, uh, due to vortex formation. So we look at those kinds of problems and also how to mitigate those types of problems. Also from a fish protection perspective, the next picture that you see is of a traveling water screen in one of our flumes. And uh, the, uh, that screen will actually move up and over the top so that it carries fish over, that fish that get impinged on the screen get carried over and um, sent back into the main water body. We do river mechanic studies, stormwater sediment removal testing, laboratory and pilot scale environmental studies. Um, we also do fish protection technology design, looking at both upstream and downstream passage. And we do air pollution control system optimization, also through physical and numerical modeling. We also do sediment transport analysis. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Richard Wakeland. Richard has over 20 years experience in all aspects of design and manufacture of differential producing primary flow elements, as well as the evaluation of data from numerous laboratory flow calibrations. He's the chief engineer at Fluidic Techniques where his duties include assisting all departments and clients with their flow measurement application. He began his career serving six years as a mechanical operator in the Navy's nuclear power program. And after that service in the Navy, he obtained a BSME degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. He's a member of ASME and serves on the Committee for Performance Test Code, ASME PTC6 steam turbine. Uh, so Richard, you have the floor. Thanks, Dave. I would like to thank all of you for attending this afternoon and thank Alden for the opportunity to be here and uh, participate in this webinar. When they first contacted me, uh, he asked if I could recommend two people in the industry that I had dealt with before and had knowledge in our system, and uh, Harry Campbell and Zach Kennedy instantly came to mind. So thank you guys for participating also. What I would like to talk about this afternoon is flow measurement, provide a little background on flow measurement, the flow meter types, and when to calibrate flow meters. There are many applications for flow measurement, uh, power plants, refineries, chemicals, gas production transmission lines, as well as many other applications. There are several things to consider when you're uh, trying to select a primary flow element. Uh, pipe size, type of fluid, the state of the fluid, the meter range that's required, what is the accuracy that's required, as well as the piping configuration, the initial cost, installation cost, and operating cost. There are several types of flow meters, including differential producers, ultrasonic flow meters, insertion pedo devices, Coriolis, and many others. This is a photograph of an ultrasonic flow meter. This was actually provided by one of our customers, but they asked us to provide the 
upstream and downstream piping. This is a photograph of a insertion pedo device. It's manufactured by Veris, called Verabark. I'm going to focus this afternoon mostly on differential producing primary flow elements. They have the largest market share for nominal pipe sizes three inches and above. There are several reasons for this. They have a well-established performance record. They're a proven technology. They've been used for many years. They're very simple by design and durable. They can be used in a wide range of applications. They provide an accurate flow measurement. They're economical. And they're typically only being replaced by other technologies where they're not performing well in a certain application. There are several different types of differential producing primary flow elements. There's orifice plates, flow nozzles, injuries, and then there's proprietary devices, such as the high head recovery flow tube and the high head recovery flow pack. This is a photograph of a concentric orifice plate. And this is the orifice plate installed in an orifice flange unit. This is a couple of American Gas Association orifice meter runs. Photos of flow nozzles and then flow nozzles that have been installed in pipes to make a flow nozzle meter run. Photos of injury tubes. And we have photos of the high end recovery flow tube and the high end recovery flow pack. There are several flow measurement standards which cover the design and manufacture of differential producing from the flow elements, including the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. They publish the MFD series for measurement of fluid flow, as well as the performance test code or PTC series. Another standard which covers a differential producer is the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. They publish ISO 5167. There is also the American Gas Association, commonly used as uh, American Gas Association, or ABA number three. And there are still yet others. Flow measurement standards provide accuracy statements. They're typically based on pipe size, Reynolds numbers, beta ratios, and they specify the piping or upstream straight length that's required before and after the primary flow element. For an example, we have uh, MSC 3MA 2007. It's an addendum to ASME MSC 3M. And in this, we see in our standard that the coefficient of discharge is stated either as a value in the case of interiors, or it may be um, stated as an equation which is used to calculate the coefficient of discharge. Now we take a particular example of a long radius flow nozzle. The coefficient of discharge equation is stated in terms of pipe Reynolds numbers and beta ratio. If you use this equation, they say the uncertainty is within plus or minus 2%. If the pipe diameter is between 2 and 25 inches, the beta ratio is between 0.2 and 0.8, then the pipe Reynolds number is between 10,000 and 10 million. In order to meet the published accuracies, it's recommended that you use the actual dimensions for the pipe and throat diameters. These are the measured dimensions. If we look, most pipe is provided, it has a 12.5% no tolerance on the pipe wall thickness, which means if we look at a 12 inch schedule 40 pipe, the nominal wall thickness is 0 0.406. The nominal diameter is 11,938. But if we consider the 12.5% no tolerance, the minimum wall thickness is actually 0.355, and the maximum pipe ID would be 12.040. 
A common practice is to use a normal flow rate to calculate the coefficient of discharge and gas expansion factor. I'm recommending that you use the actual flow rate whenever possible. And also to use pressure and temperature compensation to determine the density as the system conditions vary. And also use corrosion resistant materials for the farming elements for us. We have some instances where um, carbon steel may be used instead of stainless steel, and we notice on the calibration that they're, they're not performing as well. To improve the published accuracy, we can laboratory flow calibrate, and that can reduce the uncertainty to less than what's in the published standard. And when the primary element is used outside of the standard, we can also define what the accuracy is. Or when the upstream and downstream piping requirements cannot be met. You can calibrate with the actual upstream and downstream configuration. Here's an example of that. We have a high recovery flow pack that's being uh, calibrated at Alden Research Laboratory. We have two elbows that are out of flame installed directly upstream of the flow pack. We can also use alignment pins for orchid flakes and flanges. We have determined over the years that a very slight misalignment in your orchid flake can cause for a very poor flow calibration. As an example, you can see how much misalignment could be caused by not using an alignment pin. If the orifice plate is simply installed with a bolt centering the orifice plate. You can improve on the published accuracy by knowing your manufacturer. Design and manufacturing methods can produce better accuracy. And we've seen in some cases where a manufacturer may produce a different model for calibration than they would as a normal part to be shipped. This is a 12 inch schedule 41 nozzle meter run. It's been calibrated for two sets of pressure taps. It was manufactured by fluidic techniques and calibrated at Alden. If you notice at the middle of the curve is our theoretical coefficient, and then the two sets of pressure taps are plotted just above that, the accuracy on this one looks like it's well within a half percent. This is a, an identical unit. Once again, a 12 inch schedule 44 nozzle meter run. Once again, the accuracy is very close to the predicted value. If we take an example of this 12 inch schedule 44 nozzle meter run with the conditions stated, notice that C and Y are calculated at the normal flow rate. If we were to recalculate the maximum flow rate using these values for C and Y, we would have a 2.81% error. And if we were to include the maximum pipe diameter as allowed by the mill tolerance, we increase that uncertainty to a 2.89% error. Similarly, a 5% change in pressure creates a 2.4% error in flow. A 5% change in temperature creates a 1.5% error in flow. A 5,000 change in the bore diameter creates a 0.18% error in flow. To summarize, using a flow element that is not properly designed, manufactured, or installed for the appropriate application is like expecting a performance car to meet expectations with no maintenance, improperly inflated tires, and low octane fuel. So when performance counts, Count on fluidic techniques.
Thanks very much, Richard. Um, let me introduce Kerry Campbell. Kerry has worked in the plant performance testing and optimization area for over 25 years. At Southern Company, he's a principal engineer responsible for testing and evaluation of nuclear steam and combustion turbine performance. He's a member of the ASME Performance Test Code Oversight Committee and has served as chairman of the ASME PTC 19.6 Committee on Power Metering and as vice chair of various other PTC committees. He has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And he's a registered professional engineer in the state of Alabama. Kerry? Yes. You have the floor. Okay. So how do I make it proceed? Okay. All right, as he said, I'm Kerry Campbell. I've worked for Southern Company for about 29 years now. I've done a lot of performance testing. Of course, in testing power plants, we use a lot of flow meters. So what I want to talk about today is the benefits of uh, calibrating flow meters used in, in power plants. The typical applications of flow meters in an electric generating plant are condensate flow, which is the condensate coming out of the condenser. It's generally at low pressure and temperature. Lower feed water flows, which are at higher temperature and pressure. We have different steam flows, the high pressure, intermediate pressure, and LP steam going into a steam turbine. We have these superheating flows, which are generally water. Of course, we measure natural gas flows going to gas turbines and uh, various gas-fired boilers. Sometimes we measure fuel oil flow for um, diesel fuel fired uh, gas turbine units. Uh, third plane water flow going to our condensers and cooling towers and in reactor power calculations. Also, as uh, Dave mentioned earlier, we have six nuclear units, so we measure or calculate reactor power using feed water flow measurements. The sources of flow meter uncertainties. The first one is uh, the type of flow meter you're using for a certain application, whether it's an electronic meter or a differential pressure producing type of meter. Design of the meter and, and how well it's made affects the uncertainty. Um, there's more to the meter accuracy than just the nozzle or orifice plate itself. You also have to worry about the roughness of the pipe upstream and downstream of the meter. And a lot of the standard discharge coefficient equations are based on an assumed type of material or they're based on test data with certain surface roughnesses. And when we have a meter that has a different material, we may see a different uh, characteristic, so you cannot always rely on the standard equations. You also have uncertainty due to dimensional errors, uh, installation orientation effects in the field, upstream flow disturbances, as uh, Richard showed, the two elbows out of plane could affect your flow. And the change in meter condition, uh, when we calibrate them, they're generally new, they're in good condition. Once you install them in the plant, they may get fouled or damaged so the long-term accuracy of the meter may change. And one thing I'd like to point out is when you calibrate the meter, a lot of these uncertainties are included in your discharge coefficient, but uh, not the field installation effects and, and life effects on the meter in the field. The main reason we calibrate flow meters is we do a lot of performance testing, a steam turbine acceptance test and a various diagnostic testing of our steam turbine plants. And when we're doing a contract type of test, we try to, well, we do test our units usually according to the ASME performance test codes. So it requires that a particular meter be calibrated. Uh, we also calibrate to verify the meter was manufactured properly. Although it's a pretty well established design technique and style of meter that uh, are generally used in certain types of testing, they have to be made properly. And if not, we'll see something strange in the calibration characteristic. So we want to confirm that uh, it is performing as expected. We also like to determine and document the actual characteristics if it does not perform as the standard design. We may still be able to use the meter for very accurate measurements, even though the characteristic is, is not what you expected. If it's documented, you can still use it for high accuracy measurements. We, let, we need to establish trends in the calibration, uh, sort of shape of the calibration curve, to, so that we could interpolate or extrapolate to flows which are higher than possibly during the calibration. Uh, we sometimes recalibrate meters 
after they've been in the plant for some time to determine the effect of any fouling, cleaning, or damage to the meter. And the main reason we're calibrating meters is to reduce the uncertainty of the flow measurement and also the effect of that flow measurement on an overall test result. This is an example of a, an Orpheus meter tube which was built according to AGA Report 3 requirements. And what I'm trying to show here is that although there's an expected performance, this particular meter had a different shape or value of the CD. Once we calibrated it, we realized it, and we suspect that the change or the difference in these, uh, the actual calibration curve from the expected was due to a different surface roughness. The standard equation was pretty much uh, based on data using carbon steel pipe, and our meter happened to be stainless steel. So we think that's probably why it was uh, not following the expected characteristic. Another type of meter we use very, very frequently for steam turbine acceptance test is the ASME performance test code number six, feed water flow nozzle. And it is uh, basically a long radius elliptical inlet nozzle with a throat tap. And if it's feed water, it's in high pressure, so we generally weld the nozzles in. We do not use flanges at such high pressure. Some of our pressures are higher than 3,500 pounds PSIG, so that's, that's pretty high pressure. We'd hate to have a leak out of a flame, so we use welded in nozzles. And in this case, we had uh, four taps that were calibrated going to the PTC-6 guidelines. This is a graph of the calibration of this meter. And back in 1976, they had a procedure which plotted it against a log scale of a Reynolds number. And you can see it should be basically flat when first of a log scale. And we're trying to get the slope of this meter within the um, uncertainty of this sort of error bands that's plotted. The newer 1970 or 96 procedure plots the uh, performance of the meter versus a what's called C sub X, which is kind of an offset, an average Y-intercept of the calibration equation. And it should be constant over the entire Reynolds number range. And, and so we plot this to try to see if the actual extrapolation of C sub X is a flat line. And in this case, it was very, very flat. And there are some uh, plus or minus criteria in PTC-6 that we plot, and it was well within that range. Other types of meters we use, PTC-6 also allows you to put flow nozzles in the low pressure piping or the condensate coming out of the condenser at lower pressure temperatures. In this case, we use a flange type of meter, and the meter is wedged between two flanges where you can actually remove it, clean it more easily, inspect it, and it works very well. They also have a recovery cone to try to reduce the head loss through the meter, and it gives you a higher Reynolds number during calibration, which also works out very well. This is a picture of that actual meter installed in the, the pipe. As you can see, it's, it's inserted into the downstream pipe section, and you can remove it. You can pull out of that pipe and clean it and inspect it if, if necessary. This is a pipe and drawing showing where this particular meter was installed. In this case, it had the certain uh, upstream pipe length requirements, and it was actually reduced down from like a 16-inch pipe to a 12-inch pipe, and then we had a and larger after the meter tube to get it back to the 16-inch pipe run. This is a photograph of that meter being installed in the plant, and as you can see, it's sometimes difficult to get these meters in place, but uh, it actually, we had designed it to fit in here and it worked pretty well. It was designed to be removable so that we could inspect it and remove it after our test. We also use orifice meter tubes at times, although we prefer nozzles for the acceptance test. This was uh, an orifice plate meter used in the same plant where we had uh, also measured condensate flow farther downstream. This is a graph of the calibration of the orifice meter tube. In this case, it was a carbon steel meter tube, and it was fairly close to the, to the expected curve. It shows the actual piping of that porpoise meter tube. It had a 
very long straight run upstream, so we weren't concerned about flow disturbances. This shows an uncertainty analysis of the condensate uh, orifice meter run. And one of the common assumptions for um, an orifice meter tube is if it's uncalibrated, you assume your uncertainty is equal to the beta ratio. So in this case, I used the 0.5784 beta ratio as my uncertainty. And then you account for the uncertainty of all the other measurements that go into the flow calculation, such as the upstream pipe length and uh, diameters. Now, if they meet the code requirements, you don't have to add any uncertainty. Uh, the code assumes that if you install a certain way, there is no added uncertainty. But uh, you do have to worry about the uncertainty of DP transmitters and the pressure and temperature measurements. The next calculation shows the same meter when it's calibrated. But since it was calibrated, the uncertainty of the discharge coefficient is transferred to the uncertainty of the calibration lab which in this case was 0.2%, and it was Alden Labs. It also eliminates the uncertainty in the dimensions because any errors in the dimensions were included in the, the discharge coefficient. And this reduced the uncertainty to 0.38, while I believe previously we had 0.66. There it is. This shows some uh, calibration data on other types of meters that we've calibrated. In this case, there's no real established curve expected for a high head recovery type of nozzle, but you can see here from the calibration data, we were able to actually characterize the shape of the calibration curve and uh, curve fit that to get a repeatable equation. It shows a wall tap nozzle, those PDC-6 nozzles with throat tap. Well, wall tap nozzles work very well for routine applications, and there are no real established curve for that either. but. Uh, plotting it against the MNC3M equation, it's uh, fairly close, but it's still uh, got some uncertainty. In fact, the difference between the standard equation and actual was 0.7%. So when you do calibrate it, you don't have to assume the 0.7%. You know the uncertainty, or you have a much uh, lower uncertainty. So conclusions. The main reason we calibrate is to reduce the uncertainty in that discharge coefficient. And when you do that, you, you basically transfer the uncertainty of the flow meter, or at least the discharge coefficient, to the uncertainty of the calibration lab and the repeatability of the meter. And we also try to select meters with predictable and repeatable characteristics. They may not have to match the expected curve, but if we've actually calibrated it, we, we know its characteristic. And as long as it's repeatable, we do have a higher liability in our discharge coefficient. We also need to verify that the meter was manufactured properly, and we do that by performance. AGA.3 has a detailed inspection or procedure for building the meter according to AGA.3 requirements, but even if it appears to be built properly, we like to test it to see its actual characteristic. Uh, we also calibrate uh, data or get calibration data in order to curve fit the actual characteristics. And we compare them to the theoretical equation shape. Sometimes the meters have the same slope, but they're just offset. So we try to fit our calibration data to the theoretical uh, equation for that type of meter. Of course, once you've installed or calibrated your meter, you have to install it using similar or as close as possible duplicate uh, flow conditions as during calibration. And once you install it, you need to maintain the meter condition as during calibration. It needs to stay clean and uh, undamaged. So I believe that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much, Kerry. Next on deck here is Zach Hennig, who is the manager of pipeline field operations at Air Liquide, the world leader in supplying gases for industry, health, and the environment. Zach? Thank you, Dave. Uh, And I'm also having trouble. How do you? Uh... Okay, there we go. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Zach Kinnig. I work at Air Lakeed in the pipeline operations. And uh, other than that, pipeline operations, we have uh, the metering. Uh, we have three to 400 customers and uh, building meters along pipeline systems between Corpus Christi and New Orleans. Uh, the products include oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, 
and also we have steam and water pipelines at some uh, locations. So as I mentioned, there's over 400 billion meters. In addition to that, our group also maintains another uh, couple hundred process meters in the, the plant. So what uh, I'm going to cover today is why we calibrate meters, um, and in particular, differential meters and uh, Venturi meters, which we primarily use in our steam applications. And because of some, uh, some issues uh, over the last few years, we went through a program to replace a number of our steam meters. And a lot of what we learned came out of that program and uh, maybe share some of the, the case studies that we found with that. So we calibrate meters. You know, primarily we want the best measurement possible. And this means for Venturi meters that we calibrate them to reduce the uncertainty of the discharge coefficient. And uh, another reason we calibrate is the assurance that we have a properly built meter. And also, we have a number of customers which are very concerned about the metering that we provide for them. So we're going to cover a couple uh, few case studies. First of all, pipeline balance and the calibration of the steam and surrey meter and also a, a, a calibration of a meter that failed. Calibration. So the first case study is a pipeline balance. We have a steam pipeline that uh, runs for four miles and for few issues, few reasons we you know we need to know the balance of the, the system. And so primarily for safety. We need to know that what's going in is coming out. And with a number of old meters installed in this system and over time the the imbalance on the pipeline had increased to where it was at a, a point about 7% off between the inlet and the outlet. And so our solution was to replace one of the older Venturis with a new calibrated Venturi. And we found that the balance was reduced from 7% to less than 0.3% that we currently have. Next case study is a steam venturi calibration at a customer site. Because of the uh, plant balances with the water intake and the steam going out, it appeared that the steam meter was under registering flow of a couple percent. And as we looked into things, we found that this meter had not been calibrated and had a discharge coefficient that had been assumed to be uh, 0.985. And from our uh, experience with other meters, we had seen oftentimes that a steam meter, um, a Venturi meter, when calibrated, oftentimes had a discharge coefficient uh, above 0.99, even sometimes close to 1. So our solution was an installed meter, and we found from the calibration of the new meter that the discharge coefficient, the curve, the, the dark red curve in the middle, came out to be around 0.998 to 0.99, even actually above one at the higher Reynolds number. This was an increase of over one and a half percent higher than the assumed previous value of 0.985. In addition to that, we have some uh, we found we have some uh, insulation effects that have been negatively impacting our flow registration. And the result was that with the new meter and the, the mass balance of the, the plants indicated a steam increase of about 3.9% in steam sales. So as you imagine, that can add up and uh, just a matter of weeks that we recover the cost of that project. Last case I'd like to cover is the is a steam meter that was sent off to be calibrated, and due to poor performance in the calibration, our customer, who was also present at the site and at the calibration, rejected the meter and asked that it be 
remanufactured to uh, provide more standard uh, performance. So the problem was that we had two different tap sets, and the tap sets uh, were more than 3% difference in the calibration discharge, the, uh, the termination of the calibration and discharge coefficient. As you can see from this graph, <coughs> you have a tap set that uh, gave more what you might expect, a 0.995 range, and the other one was a 0.96, and it was determined to be some type of uh, manufacturing flaw in the uh, tap set A that caused this problem. So we learned from that is that some manufacturers can make mistakes and the importance of calibrating a meter, these defects may not be visible to the eye and which lets you know what the, uh, how your meter is going to perform. That's pretty much all I was going to cover. Uh, we uh, learned quite a bit through uh, the last few years calibrating these meters and determined that it's absolute necessity that we get these Venturi meters calibrated. And uh, Dave? Yeah, thank you very much, Zach. Um, next on our lineup is Phil Stacy, who's responsible for all flow meter testing performed at Alden's flow measurement facilities. He provides technical and administrative supervision of Alden's flow measurement department to ensure the highest standard for calibrating fluid meters ranging in size from fractional inches to 48 inches. He's also responsible for, for field performance measurement of turbines and pumps. Before assuming direction of Alden Flow Measurement Department, Phil had worked at Alden for 10 years as a hydraulic engineer conducting a variety of model studies and field flow and head measurement activities. He holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Phil? Thank you, Dave. Once again, my name is Philip Stacy, the director of the calibration department at Alden Research Laboratory. I want to step back a little bit. We've been talking about coefficients and so forth and calibrations. I want to give uh, you folks a feel for what is involved in calibration. And what is calibration? Well, it is used to, to determine how a meter performs with respect to some standard. And uh, typically, we try to uh, agree upon some national standard, and for example, a National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. And what we do is we calibrate meters by relating their performance to a traceable measurement of flow, independent of the meter's signal. And there's several methods to doing this. Uh, we use the most fundamental, which is called the gravimetric method. And in simplest terms, the gravimetric method could be called, uh, it could be referred to as a bucket and a stopwatch. Because what we are doing is running water through the meter, collecting it into a tank, and timing the, uh, recording the time it takes to fill the tank, and at the same time recording the temperature. So our fundamental measurements are weight, time, and temperature. And from these three parameters, you can determine the flow, mass flow, and then uh, based on density, the volumetric flow. Just briefly, uh, Alden's facilities, we have two main gravimetric facilities. One is uh, was constructed about 40 plus years ago and uh, purposely for um, high Reynolds numbers and the water is heated to 95 degrees Fahrenheit to reduce its viscosity and allow higher Reynolds numbers for a given flow. And in that facility we have uh, up to a 100,000 pound capacity scale system and that uh, building is now registered uh, with NAVLAP which is National Voluntary Lab Accreditation Program which is a subset of NIST in a sense. It's uh, an accreditation to a calibration laboratory's ISO 17025 quality assurance program. We also have uh, an older facility, which was the original 
the laboratory building on site here, and it makes use of the local watershed, and it's a once-through system where water flows through the building and can be boosted with pumps or allowed by gravity for calibrations and has an advantage of being very acquiescent and we can run flows without pumps. This figure is a cross section through the High Reynolds facility and it shows under the main floor a sump in which there's approximately 200,000 gallons of water. To the left we have a pump room with about 950 horsepower worth of pumps. They take the water from the sump, deliver it up through the floor into a manifold system into this main header. And this is where we install the, the uh, meters to be calibrated. There's approximately 60 to 70 feet of available straight run there for the uh, installation of the meters. The water flows through the meter from uh, left to right in this diagram, enters a series of breakdown valves and a diverter system, which is a uh, nozzle over a tank, the 100,000 pound tank as shown. Water is adjusted through the meter for each set point, and then once it's running and stable, we can uh, press a button which diverts the water into the weigh tank. Uh, simultaneously starting a timing system. When the tank's full, the timer stops, we let it settle, we record the weight, we know the time, and we've been recording temperature of the flowing fluid all the while. This slide shows a typical installation of a, an orifice plate meter section. What you're seeing is flow would be coming from left to right in this diagram. The orifice plate is sandwiched between flanges in this area. And also, you can see our connections for measuring the pressure. These hoses coming off of the two tap sets here, they're connected to uh, differential pressure transmitters. These are electronic uh, instruments used to measure the differential pressures produced by the flow meters. This slide shows one of the scales in our older facility, the Low Reynolds facility. It's a flow meter to the right hand side of the picture. Water comes from the right through the piping into the diverter system and in the diverter system is a switchway and it's difficult to see there, but this actually is a still photograph showing water entering the tank. When the tank is full, the diverter switches back, so at no time is the flow through the meter interrupted during testing. This slide shows some data that we've collected from an example 26 inch uh, Venturi meter. This was tested in the High Reynolds facility and the data represents flows from 7,000 GPM up to 19,000 GPM. And the coefficient is calculated by using the measured differential and relating that to the flow that we measure in the weight tank system. Corresponding Reynolds number went from about uh, 1 million four up to 3.2 million. On top of that same data, I've dropped in a curve representing the ASME 3M predicted coefficient. And relative to the predicted line, I can throw in some half percent um, tolerance bars to show where this meter fell in respect to the prediction. And if one were to draw an average line through the data points, it would be on the order of a quarter of a percent to the predicted value. We've heard uh, several times why meters are calibrated. 
and obviously to reduce the uncertainty, increase the confidence in the meter performance, and in addition, confirm uh, the effects of aging on these meters. We often see uh, meters come in for repeat calibration year after year, or in some cases uh, after many a dozen years or so. And we've been talking about calibration for versus prediction today. And one of the advantages to being a calibration facility is we have uh, access to uh, years worth of data. In the next several slides, we'll present the data that we've collected at all of them for uh, at least the last 10 to 15 years for several different kinds of meters. And some of these, if not all, we've been covering today. And they are all differential producing meters. Stroke tap nozzles, orifice plate sections, wall taps, nozzle meter section, and then venturi section. What I'm going to show you is uh, looking at one parameter, the, the coefficient of discharge for each one of these meters versus a predictive equation. The first graph here is, uh, represents the, the coefficient of uh, the whole population of throat tap nozzle meters that we've collected over the years. And what it is showing out of the 100% uh, of the meters we've calibrated, graphing the coefficient versus prediction. And on the predicted, you can have a, the meter may fall above the, co the prediction or below the prediction. And a throat tab nozzle, which Carrie had uh, described earlier, is often used in the uh, high accuracy performance test code testing. One of the requirements of that type of meter is that its um, calibrated coefficient fall within plus or minus 0.25% of the predicted curve. And what you can see from the data set on this type of meter is that approximately 85% of the nozzles that we've tested historically have fallen, have had a coefficient fall within plus or minus two or a quarter of a percent of prediction. I'm going to leave the quarter percent tolerance in the graph just to take a look at these other types of meters. The next meter is a very common meter, the orifice plate meter section. And you can see that its graph of um, coefficient versus prediction is less steep. And what that means is that fewer of the meters fall within uh, that quarter percent band. And looking at where the line crosses the thresholds, we can see that it's approximately 50% of the meters are within a quarter of percent of prediction. There's about 25% uh, produced a value of CD above prediction and 25% uh, below. The next meter is Venturi. And again, this is shown in the red diamonds. Um, again, the slope is less steep showing more variability in the data set. Um, and when you look at where the average values cross the quarter percent threshold, we see again about 30% fall within the prediction uh, tolerance of quarter percent. And a uh, good majority of them show uh, an average value below prediction, which is a, an interesting uh, uh, side light to this data and, and, and uh, analyzing it in this way. The last meter we're looking at here is the wall tap nozzle meter. And again, similar to the Venturi, it has a gentle slope and in, in the average value uh, shows to be above the prediction with about 30% falling within the quarter of percent range.
and I think the numbers have come up earlier in the presentation regarding uh, generic tolerances for these meters. And it is interesting to see here that uh, the graph has been flipped at plus or minus 2% from prediction. And in general, uh, I'd say all four of these kind of meters fall within 2% uh, of the predicted values. Well, in conclusion, calibration is a means to reduce the uncertainty. It links the meter performance to accepted standards. And that is tantamount to having better accuracy. And based on the results that we have collected for a variety of these major differential type meters, it shows that calibration is often the only way to account for the design and manufacturing tolerances that can significantly affect the performance with respect to the equations that are used. Dave? Hey, yeah, thanks very much, Phil. Um, so on the next slide, I'm just providing an overall summary of what we've heard today. Um, we talked a bit about flow meter accuracy and the current climate of industry concern. Um, we had Richard uh, give us an overview of flow meter types and the accuracy standards and how to know when to calibrate. Carrie talked to us about flow meter accuracy in the power generation industry. Um, Zach discussed increasing revenue in the process industry by calibrating flow meters that are measuring a product. And uh, Phil talked about methods of calibration. So on the next slide here, you can see everybody's email. We're running a little bit behind, but I still want to offer people the chance to ask some questions. So right now I'm going to unmute the phone and you can just ask your question verbally. Just a moment. The leader has turned lecture off and your line has been unmuted. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, this is Daryl Barnes at Triad. I have no questions and I really do um, appreciate all the um, Appreciate the opportunity to, to listen in on this webinar. And uh, Richard, Carrie, Zach, Phil, I uh, appreciate all y'all's efforts in this. Really nice. Great. Well, thanks for attending, Daryl. <coughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, then we'll conclude, and thanks everybody for attending, and thanks to the speakers for your efforts in putting this together. Thank we'll you let again. everybody know uh, when slides and uh, recording are available. Thank you okay. very much.